Hey, Ash from All Things Dentistry, and uh, this is the place where we love to share those hints and tips in dentistry. And if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this video with your friends. So we're going to talk about extracting this tooth number 4-6. And there's a couple crazy things you'll see here. We're using a periotome. If you're not familiar with those, it's very, it's simply a great instrument. You'll see how we use that to wedge out a tooth. The second part is you're going to be seeing a rubber dam and doing this extraction. Third, we're going to talk about some uh, ridge preservation. And then fourth, we're going to talk about uh, what does the comb beam look like. So without further ado, let's start with looking at the comb beam and how, why was this tooth taken out? So the reason why this tooth was taken out is if you can see, this is tooth number 47 here in this patient, and he was asymptomatic, but on a, on a bite wing radiograph when he came in for his exam, um, this patient, David is his name, he's a really nice patient, about 45 years old. No history of trauma, no history of, of uh, orthodontics, um, but he did have this uh, crazy in image, and you can see radio on the on the uh, bite wing. So when we took a cone beam of it, you can see here is the external cervical invasive resorption. So if this is, we're looking from the axial section here, but if we look from the coronal on tooth number four, seven, you can see more of that um, destruction of that tooth. So it's kind of right in the middle of the tooth. So if this is the tooth number four, seven, this is the lingual, this is where the tongue is, the lingual border. This is the, you know, the buckle shelf, not the buckle shelf, but almost the buckle shelf starting. And there's a restoration on the tooth here, the roots, and then you can see this dark radiolucency there, or rare fraction, uh, that is fairly significant. It goes right into the pulp. And the patient was asymptomatic, but he was starting to feel a few symptoms uh, about a month after we initially saw him and had the comb beam taken. So let's take a look from the sagittal here. You can see it. Look at the size of that destruction. So we really, you know, I, I've tried to honestly try to remove this size, not quite this big, but tried to remove these resorptive lesions in the in the past, and then it's actually quite difficult to save these teeth. So we deem this one non-restorable. So our this appointment, what we did was we're going to extract this tooth under local anesthesia. Great patient. So this is him here. We've got uh, this is I don't know if you do it yet, but I link this to my iPhone. I use uh, this. They're cheap. I, their MPOW from uh, off of Amazon. They've got active noise canceling, and I just play a playlist that's downloaded on my iPhone. And I don't even have Wi-Fi in this in this part of the building, so it just listens to a playlist and it cancels out all the knowledge. And actually, what's helpful is that Angela and I can talk and do our job. Um, we can do it quietly, but we don't. You know, we can talk back and forth, and the patient is kind of you know in their own zone. So because it's tooth number four seven, we give him an inferior alveolar nerve block with a, um, I've actually given him um, with lidocaine, I've given him a buckle, long buckle, and I've also given an, a, a uh, an infiltration with some articaine, but it's still, I cold tested the tooth, here I come up with my gun, I cold tested the tooth and he's still feeling symptoms. So really what I've done now is, and I really focus a lot on endo, is give him a intra ligamentary. So we're using the LigmaJet or my PDL gun, and there's this lidocaine here, and I'm just going to go. I'll hit go here. Let me turn this down. Yeah. We're just going to hit. Yeah, nice. Any pain? So what I find is that they'll feel a bit of pressure. Sometimes not, and I'm looking for. I'm just going to. So this is an ultra short. I should stop. Stop back. Let me go backwards here for a sec. This is an ultra short. 30 gauge needle and Dr. Steve taught me this and I thought these would always break but they don't I've been doing this for five years now and if I can't get if I can't get a cold test negative you know lip lip numbness does not indicate if that this tooth is numb so the lip might be numb but I'll tell you doing enough endo and teeth especially mandibular molars that uh, they might not be numb so we'll do a cold test and if there's percussion sensitivity I'll also percuss to see if there's any pain uh, that way, I have confidence that when I go into this tooth, it's numb. The patient has more confidence because my experience has been like 98% of the time, if they don't respond to the percussion, if there was percussion pain prior to anesthesia or cold, they don't respond to either of those. 98% chance they're going to be good to go for the most of the procedure. Uh, so I'm going to make sure that that tooth is numb and it's not numb at this point. Maybe we didn't wait long enough for the alveolar, alveolar nerve block. Sometimes it takes up to 30 minutes. But what I have learned is using a 30 gauge needle with just lidocaine in the mesial, you know, in the mesial and in the distal. Yeah, nice. Any pain? No. 
So some, like I said, sometimes they'll feel pressure, sometimes they won't. And I'll just get, well, I don't even get her. She just is an amazing dental assistant. She'll just do it on her own. She's, she's tracking. So right there, what you saw right there, I forgot this happened. Right there is I was pushing too much pressure. Watch this. Let me go back. So too much pressure too fast because this PDL space is really small. So you can put a lot of pressure on. That's the beauty of the lever action of this gun. But what will happen is that the cartridge will actually break. So don't give up. That doesn't mean don't stop. These rarely, some of these uh, PDL injectors have a little plastic sleeve in this in this cartridge. You know what I'm gonna what I'm gonna tell you now is reload, redo it again, and go slower. Just go slower because this injection here will make all the difference. So let me reload here. She's gonna and you know what I do is we tell the patient it's a really bad taste because you know it's gonna get all over the place. So we're gonna redo it again. Same spot. Yeah. Use some more freeze numbing here, okay? Mm -hmm. We go nice and slow, and like I said, Stay you can there. slowly see right. it here moving. Maybe I'm going. Well, you can see it moving. Patient is totally numb. That's my main concern: is making sure patients are numb and they can't feel what I'm doing. So you can see you bend this little specific ways just to try to get around the nooks and crannies of these teeth. It might actually bend out and I might have to re replace it. What I am looking for, this so doesn't feel anything, I'm looking for this tissue to blanch a bit. And then I'm going to put at least a half carp in total, like a quarter here, a quarter there. I tell them they may, their heart might race, like if I can get it really, because this is really considered an intraosseous injection. If if I can truly get it in a full intraosseous, their heart will start racing. And I will uh, mention that to them. Give them that, you know, just the, 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 conf the comfort and the confidence that I know that it's because of what I'm doing and it should pass in approximately um, a minute. So you can see how slow this, or you can see it now. So I start off slow. And then once I sort of, I don't know if I borrow a channel or something, now you can start to see the plunger start to move a little bit quicker. And what I'm looking for here is you can see some of the liquid is coming out, some of the anesthetic is coming out. Um, I'm looking for that not to happen. We're going to give them a big rinse just to make sure that everything's good to go. I just dropped him with it. All right, my friend, let's test this again. There oh, so yeah. this is what the check was. Oh, I remember now. So it wasn't a cold test, essentially because remember the size of that size of this. Essentially, what I did was when I numbed him up initially, I just took my explorer and went bang right into the pulp. And if he didn't feel that, we're good to go. So let's see what happens. Nothing. Yeah, he should. Poke he in sh the pulp test. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. I did this about a month ago, so two months ago. So. I I had been a month ago and then all of a sudden COVID happened and I'm supposed to take his membrane out. Okay. I'm going to put this on your left side just to bite on. So we always use a bite block. And I use that for like 90%. Put this ring, put on your tooth. And then I saw this thing on uh, online using a rubber dam for sure, extraction. Okay. This is actually the first That's time I've ever done it. And I'll okay. be honest, I will continuously do it. Normally, I don't know why we didn't do it this time. Normally, we'd put the rubber dam on with the the, the clamp at the same time. Uh, oh, that's right, because it was a split dam. So Angela made a big split, and because there was a large space, so we were dentalists in the number three, four, six spot. So that's why she's great. She, like if you all you could experience the beauty of Angela's or our assistant, she's incredible. So what she did was we put the clamp on. Yes, there should be floss wrapped around uh, the butterfly part of it, um, or the ring part. Uh, there isn't because I've often caught those in a high speed. So she, we put the clamp on, and then she did a split dam approach. And I saw this in a video before uh, online, actually, doing extraction with a rubber dam. And I'll be honest, I'll never go back to not doing this. It keeps... You'll see it keeps the procedure so much just more organized. Uh, the tongue's out of the way. The patient's not even paying attention. He's got his active noise canceling headphones. Everything's ready to rock. Like it's just incredible. So it's a lot more controlled. We're not messing around with the lip, tongue. Um, 
and especially rinse like water from our uh, 45 degree angle handpiece. I think it's an NSK or surgical handpiece. There's no water. It's just incredible. So what I'm going to do first, let's see what I do first. I'm using these instruments called a periotome. If you haven't used one, they're they're absolutely necessary for an atraumatic extraction technique. Um, there's lots of different ways of doing these extractions. Really, essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to preserve the cortical plates, uh, the interceptal cancellous bone I'm not too worried about. you know. And one of the things you got to be concerned with is if you know we're going to wedge this apically, try to get some blood flow, some, he uh, some hemo, um, not hemostasis. I don't know why I'm thinking that right now. We're trying to get some blood flow into that PDL. And, you know, one of the things that we're going to do is you're going to place your, you know, if you've been classically trained, you're going to place your elevator here and then you're going to pop out by accident the, the 48. So we don't want to do that. So we don't have a lot of places to wedge uh, an elevator in here. So likely we're going to use our peritomes to try to sever some of those um, interceptal fibers and the transeptal fibers, all the fibers that are um, at the coronal portion. And then what we're going to do is we're going to try to wiggle this out with uh, forceps because we're not going to get a lot of um, movement with a with an elevator. And it's taken a lot of extractions, thousands for me to be able to slowly, to have the confidence I can get that out. And I know that feeling. And that's the reason why I kind of wanted to publish this because it's just to watch the full technique. This isn't the perfect technique uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But I think there are a couple things that I've been doing now over the past 20 years that have kind of been helpful. And the first thing I can tell you is proper anesthesia. Make sure the patient's numb. That's the biggest one if you're not doing uh, conscious sedation. So this is another version of the blade on the same instrument. It's just another peritome. I'm trying to induce uh, hemorrhage, there's the word I'm looking for, hemorrhage in the PDL space to kind of uh, elevate that tooth itself. So I'm using, I'm going slow. And what I've learned is that patients, more patients and patients will get that tooth out versus trying to rush. Because I've rushed, I've messed up my landmarks, I've tried to take teeth out. And then during my residency, I had to get help tail between my legs, help from my colleagues or the surgeon on uh, on the call. And the thing is, is that, oh, sorry, my head's in the way. So we're placing apical pressure. You can see it's pretty straightforward. We're just wedging that in there. I'm not doing any rotational forces because that'll probably break that blade. It's really, you know, it's thin and it's designed for compression. So pushing apically. There's a lot of, there's these proximators that I haven't tried. Uh, maybe we try them, get them ordered. But you can see the beauty of the, the rubber dam so far is that it keeps the tongue out of the way. Like we haven't dealt with any way. I mean, I mean don't, get, don't get me wrong, we're just starting. Uh, but patient's comfortable. My assistant's comfortable. I'm comfortable. I got this new handy cam camcorder from Costco I'm trying out that you're watching. And it seems to be working, so everything's good. So what we're going to do next, okay, let's fast forward here because it's... You can see how much time I spent just trying to get some hemostase or he uh, hemorrhage into that PDL space. So watch this. So this is called our 77R uh, and watch the movement. So you can see that you'll see that 4.8. And you could argue that I'm actually doing it wrong. Uh, but most times I've never had any problems and uh, with kind of doing that type of wedging. But you can see the 8's moving, so that's not going to help us. I'm going to try to wedge it against the soft tissue here a little bit, maybe underneath the little bit of the, the uh, osseous crest. Trying to get a little bit of movement. And literally I asked Angela if she could see. I think you can hear it. Is that moving the tooth of the... Yeah, it's, it's hard to tell, right? So, so we're getting a little bit of movement. That's good. It's not ankylosed. So we try that a few times, and then she hands me the cow. She loves to, I don't know, hand me these cow horns. I don't know why. Uh, but I'm going to try to get in there, and boop, off comes a crown, which is a perfect move. So I think 
the critical point, this is what we teach our young dentists, is that if you can't get any movement or part of the crown breaks off, this is what you want before you start sectioning. You want to get rid of, because the problem is, imagine if this is you as a patient and you have this amalgam restoration, and you're going to section this too. This amalgam gets all in the tissues and everywhere. So, and this is what an old surgeon taught me, and I've done it to this day. Cut the two, section the crown off. All you need to do is section, take your 701 burr and cut sideways all the way to about here and then crack that crown off. Because now from, I'm not cutting through 10 millimeters of crown to get to the furcation, to another, to another you know, 12, two, three millimeters to the furcation. I'm only cutting like, say, six millimeters from here. And I can see it. They're straight across. And how many times have you gone to section a tooth and you sectioned, you know, you, you, you started and you started here because the angle of the burr is such that you, you cut half the distal root in half and then you're still fumbling around and you don't know where the frication is. I mean, how many times have I done that? So, you know, a great lesson here is before we take a look at the size of this exorption, exorption, resorption lesion is if you're going to section teeth, you crack half it off, cut the rest of the crown off, and then you can get a clear view of where you're going. That's a big beginner mistake. No one teaches you that. So you can see here's the size of the, so here we go. The size of the lesion is huge. You know, it's essentially all of that. Now imagine trying to save that tooth. Oh, it'd take you forever. And even trying to burn all that out. There's a there's a chemical called trichloracetic acid you use to burn the little tissue tags out. I mean, it just takes forever. So that's what I mean. So this actually is a 703 burr, and it's way too big. And uh, I put it on my handpiece and I was like, you know, this is way too big. Um, you need a 702 or 701. And this is what normally happens. At this angle, you usually go ahead and section with the crown on. And then you cut, like I was saying, you cut half the distal root off. And you're still, you still got two roots attached. You just cut off a sliver. How many times have I done that? So this burr is way too big to be able to get uh, a decent channel. So all you're trying to do is make a little channel and create space. So we're going to switch that out for 702, and she put it on there. Switch that out. So you can see at this time, there's still, there's not much to do. Oops. Sorry. There's not much to do as a dental assistant. I was going to say, look how easy it is. We're just sitting and chilling. So essentially what I'm doing is... Okay, here we go. Okay. So... I'm going to bring my burr in. I'm going to try to go straight, uh, straight up and down as possible. And I'm going to go right into that frication and hit bone. And there's a difference between tooth structure and bone. And when you have this amount of... So the problem is, is that when you're cutting, if we look at the burr... I'm sorry, I really apologize for doing all this stopping. But when you have this burr and you've cut this little channel and your burr diameter is actually... Let's go back. The burr is not actually bigger than the shank. So my experience has been when you cut all this through, it's really tough. This little burr doesn't cut all this tooth structure. So you don't know, what am I saying? You don't know when you've gotten into bone or not in the, in the, uh, in the frication. But when you're only cutting just dentin now, you know when you drop through. I mean, I, if I haven't convinced you of cutting the crown off by this point, oh my gosh. Lucas, where are you? He did, I told him that, and he told him that secret, and he still didn't do it. So right there, you can see it just drops into the bone, into the frication, and it's really simple. And my buddy Amir taught me just recently, you know, like you can sacrifice that intercept the bone, keep the cortical plate as much as possible. So all I'm doing is creating a channel back and forth. I didn't even go all the way across. I'm going to stop about 90% because you don't need to. It's going to crack enough. It'll, you know, once you place that elevator in there, it's going to go click. And literally, I'm using that elevator as a screwdriver. I'm just going to try to unscrew one of those root tips. Actually, in this case, I used a set. What was helpful, actually, was using that uh, Minnesota retractor in, in reverse. So you can see it's got the little the little back end uh, pulling back the tissue there. And the rubber dam is really helpful. So I'm just placing this in here. And this is this extraction is not going to go as simple as you think it's going to happen. So we're going to place force. That's all I'm doing is nice and light forces. I'm not going uh, buckle lingual because the lingual plate's really, th you know, it's much thinner than the buckle uh, plate on this on the uh, on these teeth. Sorry, my hands in the way. 
Okay, let's go over here. So we're going down the middle, we're trying to turn. I'm trying to get some movement. And literally all we're trying to do is get movement of one of those roots. That's all we're doing. So I'm monkeying around. There we go, getting some movement. And then... Um, Oh, she handed me this thing. I don't. The B point. Unless you have a purchase. I don't know why she handed me that. Unless I have a purchase point and something to angle it on, it would be helpful, but it was useless. So we're going to. All we're doing is doing some wiggling. That's it. We're just wiggling, wiggling, wiggling. I'm not placing any forces. Sorry. Oh, there. So now you can see the forces. So we're going to try with a simple set of forceps just to bring that out. We'll go back and forth just nice and easy. And it will come out. It's pretty simple, actually. You're just waiting for it to come out, don't aren't you? There we go. Oh, look at that. And the beauty of the rubber dam is that that slipped out. Now, normally we have a throat pack, but the rubber dam actually prevented that from going down the patient's, you know, in the back of the throat. So a throat pack is usually a bunch of either a 4x4 of gauze or a couple 2x2s, but there it is. So you can see where we sectioned it. Let's get that here. She grabbed it. So uh, you can't really tell. Okay, so now we got to get that piece out, which is really simple. Or so I thought. So there's the interceptor bone. Here's the mesial extraction socket. There's the interceptor bone. So what we're going to do is that's not that important, that interceptor bone. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to weasel it out of there. And I couldn't weasel it out. So what I used to do is I lay this huge flap and then cut this buckle, uh, buckle trough. But I don't do that anymore. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut right here. I'm going to make this little groove. And actually, unfortunately, I made it a little bit too big. And I know where the angulation of that, that 4 8 is. It's going this way. So I'm not too worried about hitting it. So I'm going to make a groove. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to put a trough in. So that's the end of that video. I'm going to put a trough in. Ruby. Oh, where'd that other video go? Sorry. Right. Okay, there we go. I'm going to put a trough in. So I'm going to put a trough in and I'm going to get, look what I'm doing. I'm actually removing some of that septal bone just so I, because it's soft. I'll get rid of that so that tooth can kind of fall out this way. And of course my head's in the way. All right, so let's try to weasel that out of there. So I'm not engaging the tooth now. The 4-8, you can see now we got a little bit of movement. I'm just engaging. The problem was is that when I was going back and forth, I made that groove a little bit too big. I need to wear a hairnet. Or get my hair out of the way. So we're fiddling around. I'm just going to get a bigger. There we go. We're going to get a bigger one. Normally, you know what I could have used is peritomes just to get, induce more bleeding. The car is not going to work. Induce a little more bleeding. There we go. Slowly but surely. What I could do is remove more of that interceptor bone. So I'm just getting movement. Try. I could take a periotome and go boop, 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 just like we did in the beginning. I mean, there's all different types, types, types of ways to do it. And... Oh, there we go. Just kind of weaseled it out. Boop, that's it. So you can see it clear. So here is a troughing on the distal. So I was troughing into the tooth, which is okay. And then that's it. So we've preserved both cortical plates, buccal and lingual. And now what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of all the... We're going to rinse it out really well. We're going to get rid of all the PDL and all the other extra tissue. And then what we're going to do is we're going to bone graft. And I'll show you just a really simple technique using um, some ridge preservation material and a cytoplast membrane and then that's it. We'll do that in part two.